Welcome to the Great Lakes Chamber Music Festival's March Virtual Vignette. Before we start the programme this evening, I invite you to mark your calendars for our first ever virtual gala on Friday, May the 7th at 5.30pm. We have a wonderful evening planned. Christine Gerke and I will collaborate along with the extraordinary Talea String Quartet to present the musical portion of the evening. Full details, including how to reserve your tickets, will be emailed to you soon and be posted on the festival website. Now I'm excited to introduce multi-Grammy award-winning cellist Nick Fotinos and his wife Yasko Aura, renowned chamber musician and distinguished vocal coach. After the performance, Jennifer and I will moderate a live question and answer session with Nick and Yasko. Please submit your questions using the YouTube chat feature. As a variation, on the theme of the highly anticipated vignette cocktail videos from Jennifer and our daughter Emily, Nick has prepared his own cocktail video, which he will introduce himself. Hi, I'm Nick Fotinos, and together with my wife Yasko Ora, uh, I'm really excited to be performing for you all again virtually as part of Great Lakes Chamber Music Festival's virtual vignette series. We'll be presenting a program called Time Transfixed, which is the title of the last piece on the program. And it's based off of a painting by the famous surrealist painter René Magritte. The work depicts a steam train speeding out of a fireplace, and to me has a sense of time both at a standstill but also rushing and crashing forward. And I really think that's a great metaphor for how I and many others have experienced the past year during the pandemic. These four pieces on the program explore a sense of timelessness, each in their own way. 
and I hope you can enjoy them with another timeless classic, which is The Daiquiri. The first piece is Caroline Shaw's In Manus Tuas, or In Your Hands, and this is based on a 16th century motet by Thomas Tallis. Caroline had the experience of uh, listening to this piece, but only very briefly in a church setting, and so she tried to capture that sensation of only hearing a single moment. So you'll only hear uh, some very small fragments of the piece which uh, she starts and ends from white noise and shadows and sometimes rushes forwards, but also sometimes is frozen in time.
The next piece is the middle movement of an arrangement I made of a work by John Adams uh, for violin and piano called Road Movies. John describes the movement as a simple meditation of several small motives, a solitary figure, and an empty desert landscape. To me, the work is also a palindrome, beginning and returning to stillness. Thank you. 
This next work for cello and electronics is by Puerto Rican composer Angelica Negron and is called Panorama. And I love the way that she describes the work, which really resonates with how I felt at many points during the current pandemic. She writes, uh, it's a piece inspired by failed attempts of having a wide and unbroken view of a situation. The piece explores confusion and longing within a series of cyclical events.
The last piece on this concert is Australian composer Maria Grenfell's Time Transfixed, here in its North American premiere. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, she took as her inspiration the René Magritte painting of the same name, and her words about the piece are that, uh, for her, that painting depicts an eerie pause of time. Even though the train is suspended, the color palette seems dated, and the clock gives the impression that time has stopped. Steam is coming out of the train's boiler as if it were still moving forward. My piece aims to portray the sadness inherent in the painting with suspended harmonies that have a slight but smooth and rocking rhythmic effect.
Hello. Hello. Yeah. Nice to Hello. see you. Nice to see you both. Well, um, welcome back uh, to everybody who's who's with us. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Paul Watkins. This is my wife, Jennifer, right here, and we're so excited to have Nick Frutinas and his wife Yasko Ura with us. And what we're going to do before we start talking about your wonderful, fantastic performance, um, we're going to raise a glass. Jen has been down in the kitchen with your, uh, with your, your recipe. With your recipe. So <laughs> cheers and yeah, thank you cheers. So much. Absolutely. Congratulations. Um wonderful. Mm. Thank you. I'm trying to imitate Yasko's <laughs> 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 It was a slim. You know, it was very, uh, yeah. It was wonderful. Well, for, for, first of all, um I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping and tell everybody who's who's with us and listening uh, welcome thank you for joining us um if you'd like to ask a question we already have a few questions lined up for you um, and yeah. apart from some of some of our own um do type it into the youtube chat feature um and we'll um we'll we'll drop and dangle a few questions uh, before you as we go on uh but first of all uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much for wonderfully creative video and a, and a great collection of pieces and, and for your beautiful playing for both of you. Thank you so much. Adi. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you too. I oh, really no, no, no. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so keenly aware that during um, this pandemic time and in the virtual vignettes that we've had, we've, um, you know, in, to some extent fallen back on, um, on, on, on very old and familiar piece, and it was so wonderful to have a, a program of, of, of four. I mean, of course, John Adams is, is uh, you know, an American classic by, by now, but um, also to have three women composers, composers of color as well. Thank you so much for, for, for putting that together. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, how you, how you did put that together? Sure. Um, well, so the idea came, so Maria Grenfell is a composer who I've known for a while. And back a while ago, maybe like, I think even pre-pandemic, she sent me uh, this piece, Time Transfixed. Um, and she, it was originally written for saxophone, oh. uh, but she had made an arrangement uh, for cello. And she's like, oh, you know, if you're interested. And I was like, huh, okay. Yeah. And I, I kind of put that in this file that I have of all these pieces. And so mm -hmm. when this opportunity came up, um, I was looking through the pieces 
that I had. And I was like, oh, you know, I've never played that. And time transfixed, what, you know, what does that mean? And so like, I got reading about it and like, oh, what a great metaphor for the time that we're in, you know, both, both standing still, but still moving inexorably forward. And so then when I started thinking about that, you know, what other composer, composers, you know, pieces that I know of or some that I learned, like I, this is the first time I've ever performed the Shaw, for example, um, oh, you know, right. pieces that kind of had a certain timeless quality about them, like that, you know, maybe bar, like in Shaw's case, you know, maybe borrowing from a different era and kind of uh, putting that through a certain lens for her of, of, you know, just catching a few snippets in a church. Um, or of, you know, or with John Adams, which um, that piece, you know, is kind of flanked by these really athletic movements, but this is kind of a moment of repose. Um, yeah, and then and then the Negron too is just this kind of wide open, beautiful expanse that is in a sense like timeless in that you don't, it's, it's just, there's not necessarily a melody per se, or it's so slow as to not really be noticeable, but there's yet this sense of time and of it going somewhere. And so they all kind of explore that sense of timelessness in their own way. Absolutely. I mean, I can see actually, uh, you've already answered without me even <laughs> asking a, a, a question from one of our board members, Sandy Reitelman, um, who said, uh, can you see that? Yeah, well, I've got the right glasses. There's a picture of Sandy too. It's, you know, yeah. leading the witness. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, thank, I'm glad, thank you, Sandy, that they achieved that sense of timelessness. That's really what I was going for. And, you know, it's funny with so much cello music, there's so much slow cello music. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's all really beautiful, but does anybody want to hear just a recital of just slow cello music? Not necessarily. Sometimes that can be great, but, you know. But there was, uh, you did do a slow recital, a, a slow recital, but there was so much variety within right. the pieces and i was thinking actually um yasko's piano pass in 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 the in the grenfell was actually quite active i mean you know you're moving all the time yeah. in that piano pass which but you brought a, a beautiful sort of sense of peace to it. Did, 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 it it's kind of contradictory in a way isn't it that you get a feeling of time stopping by something that's constantly moving constantly you know, emotion. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely went for certain color and gestures in Grenfell's piece, and and yeah, this that sense of suspended time that happens in what could be a very active sixteenth notes in my piano part, but I definitely didn't hear it that way, and it was sort of atmospheric in a way. Yeah. You know, I really I I did look at the painting quite a bit when I was trying to figure out what kind of color to go for and that image of train coming out of a fireplace it's in a very striking and very much suspended. It is it's it really uh, it's once you've seen those a lot so many of those Magritte images you don't forget them do you they they really stick with you amazing. They really imprint themselves. Yeah. And it's amazing actually that piece of art is actually at the Art Institute of Chicago. So oh, I've seen yeah. it before, and actually, mm -hmm. my wife and daughter might go see it tomorrow. Uh, oh, I have a daughter, like mommy daughter date, so they might get a chance yeah. to go see it tomorrow. So oh, nice, nice, yeah. and that's that's your daughter who um who made her her debut for for yes. us earlier <laughs> earlier on in the pandemic. Exactly, yeah, she's working through her Suzuki books, so you know we're uh, and she's on violin with the hopes that someday we all get to play in a little trio together. Oh, fun. not professionally, I would just. I'd be overjoyed if at some point we could sit down and, you know, read through a Haydn or something or something, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that's that. That's great. So does she does she play p uh, piano as well? Or she, she... No, we try that. <laughs> but I think two instruments, uh, it's just a lot to practice on a daily basis. So and she just had a ukulele lesson. That's so true. there's also that, you know. Oh, the so, yeah, we have. We, we've been through all that. All that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. During the pandemic. Our, our our younger daughters taught herself how to play the guitar on top of everything. So uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that around. <laughs> Indeed, but it's so nice, isn't it, to have kids? I I don't know, uh, Yasko. If you did, you have it. Did you attempt to teach her some piano at some point or? Yeah, sorry to bring up. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, no, not really. I mean, even now, I always ask him to help her practice with violin because I'm not very good at supervising. No, but you it's um, even that's hard. She really doesn't like me showing her anything. And I like 
we have an extra violin and I can show her on cello. I've tried to show her on guitar. She just doesn't like, you know, it's really, most musician parent friends I know, like it's really hard to teach your kids. It's just really hard. I don't know if you've experienced that. We oh, have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. We have, but we, what, one thing that we, we, we loved actually was the Suzuki method. It, it wasn't, a, I, I didn't start the cello or the piano that way. But um, I worked with a lot of colleagues um, in, in the UK, really wonderful violinists, particularly started with Suzuki. And we did start Eliza with Suzuki. And, mm -hmm. um, it, it gave her a wonderful sort of grounding, actually. It was very, very good, wasn't it? It was, no. And it was a, a deeply uh, humbling experience for me because I was the one who went along to the lessons and I had to learn how to play the violin. And she picked it up about 10,000 times more quickly and more easily than I did. And uh, yeah, it was deeply humiliating. <laughs> that I had no talent. Um, so yeah. Nick, when when did you start uh, with with the cello? Was that was that your first instrument, or did you did you start? It, piano? Well, you know the story. So my mom was a really amateur, uh, sorry, avid amateur musician. So she played viola, flute, French horn, recorder. Mm -hmm. um, so music was huge in her house, and she didn't make it a profession, but um, but she it was there. And all of, I have two older sisters, and she encouraged all of us. And I, so you know, when I was like five, like oh, I really want to play violin. You know, I really want to play violin. And my mom's like, okay, okay. So when I was six, she sent me to the summer camp. And the first time I ever held a violin under my neck, I was like, oh, this is horrible. Uh, like, yeah. what else do you have? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, God, like, no, this is, no. What else mm. do you have? And so they gave me a cello, like, ah. Oh. You know, like, it just <laughs> felt right. Like, oh, this is so much more ergonomic. And so, you know, and that was it. You know, and, and yeah, so I started with when I was six, but, um, my family moved around a little bit. Like I didn't really kind of get going more until I was, I mean, I, it was like lessons weren't continuous until really I was about 12. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. And what about you? Uh, yes, go. You... So I was born in Japan and raised in Japan for part of my life. And I was like three or four when I started piano and I did this through Yamaha's elite program where I think they made me have perfect pitch and they were teaching us how to compose by the time we were six and you know we had ear training and music theory and so I'm that typical Asian pianist. <laughs> so, yeah you don't hear as much about the Yamaha method but it's it yeah. sounds pretty intense. Yeah no they were great I mean I you know I got a great uh, well-rounded musical education not just how to play the piano but Theory and ear training was really helpful at an early age. Was th was this in in Tokyo? May I ask, or in another? Um, I was in Kyoto, Japan. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful! Gosh, that's that's great. And do you still um do you still uh, do you still play on a Yamaha piano? <laughs> Actually, I own Yamaha. Yeah, I couldn't afford Steinway. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I got my Yamaha, and that's what I practice on. Yeah. Well, I, do, I I don't know if you know uh, Nick or, or Yasko, but. Uh, well, you, you you might Nick actually. The, Jennifer's uh, late mother was a pianist, uh, Ruth Ruth Laredo, um, was a one, wonderful yeah. Swedish pianist who always played on Steinways, and we're we're very lucky still to have inherited her her Hamburg B that she used. But towards the end of her career, so certainly when I met her, didn't mm. she move to Yamaha? She did start doing some Yamaha she stuff. Did. Yeah. 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 yeah, she was quite impressed by some of the the, the, the bigger concert grands, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah oh. they do the pianos. Exactly. So, Nick, you, you're obviously well known to all of us, to, to our audience from, you know, being in Eighth Blackbird. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really interested to know, um, you, you took that path into very, very cutting edge contemporary music. Um, what, what, led, what led you there? Was, it, was there a time when you realized that this was the kind of music that you, that you absolutely had to do and it was really... It was really your love, or, or can you, any sort of moment where you thought, "Ah, this is this is really for me." Sure, um, I always had an interest in in contemporary music, and I was lucky, especially in high school. I can think about you know certain orchestral experiences I had, even you know playing like even in like Oakland Youth Symphony playing a piece by Ollie Wilson, or like or or having conductors. You know, the first time I played Rite of Spring, and that like being like 
you know, blowing my mind. And so going to Oberlin, I think, had a lot to do with it, too, for our undergrad, which is incidentally where we met. Um, and um, oh, that, you, just, you just ticked off another question that someone <laughs> asked. <laughs> I swear I didn't see these questions beforehand. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, so we met at Oberlin. and Freshman year. In freshman year. Great. And, um, and there's a really high percentage of OBs that, that – go on to marry other OBs, but that's 60%. a 60%. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of crazy. We'll let our daughter know who's a freshman there. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it was always really encouraged. Um, you know, like the, one of the, the person that put together eighth Blackbird, who's still a mentor to the group, Tim Weiss, and who's still there. Mm -hmm. um, he really, you know, it was more than just being a great teacher. It was really instilling a love of that repertoire and really not treating it as other, but really treating it as like, you know, this music has, has things to say that are relevant to our time and like really bringing us into that. And for me, I mean, I, there's still so much about, I, I love a lot of the cello repertoire and, and even today's pieces weren't necessarily like avant-garde necessarily. They were, you know, um, you know, I think kind of tonal, even, you know, key signatures and stuff, but but, um, you know, I, I really like, um, I don't want to say being an advocate, you know, is like a mission, but but in a way, like, I just, um, I have a deep love for that repertoire and being like kind of, you know, the first person to play a piece, you know, what they call an opera, you know, when you originate a role. Like, right. there's like, you know, the, nobody else has has seen this music or experience, you get to be the first one to share this with an audience. Like that's mm -hmm. a really awesome, but also a really beautiful and empowering uh, statement, I think, to make. And one that really resonates with me. Absolutely. In fact, what you've just said now very eloquently has brought to mind a couple of questions that you got on your phone from our co-chairs, uh, uh, Virginia and Michael Gehave, um, who are the co-chairs of the board of the Great Lakes Shame Music Festival. Um, and so what's well, the first the question, which is from Virginia, was uh, in in what composer do you find your musical niche and why? That's to either of you. You want to start with that one? No, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, that's kind of like asking what's your favorite kid. Hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know, I can't, I, I, I I will say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names. Cause like, I mean, on any given day, like all the music I presented today, I really love and they're all fairly different. And there's even more other different pieces that I could have programmed, but didn't, you know, so it, it's more about, um, do I feel like I have a voice within that piece? Do I feel like I can bring this across to an audience and connect with them and bring them into it? in a way that speaks to me. And in a certain sense, that's ineffable. You know, it's, what's the, you know, talking about music is like, is like bicycling about swimming or something. There's like some quote like that from someone, you know, it's, I don't know. I can't, I'm going to deflect that one. That's well, <laughs> well, well deflected. Maybe, 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 your, maybe your wife has, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very sophisticated version of the, who's your favorite composer, but I, I can, I think, I mean, Ginny can correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, but I think I can see why she's asking that question because in the, in, in, in the, in, in, in your particular musical niche that you've, that, that you've been in for, for a long time, that actually that's going to lead me to another question in a second. Um, obviously you've seen many new composers and some unknown composers and, uh, let me, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to press you on this a bit, Nick. Um, let me broaden it a bit. Because you also said the, the pieces that you uh, played tonight were, by and large, quite tonal. Um, but, you know, contemporary music, 20th and early 21st century music has, do you think it's going in any particular direction? It's certainly very different from the sort of Darmstadt um, dropping, you know, trays of crockery into 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 buckets uh, of the 70s you know there's still plenty of that I mean, we've got there's, there's all of that and more where where do you do you fall into a, a particular one of no I'm, I'm gonna deflect this again by saying <laughs> one of the great joys i find in this age and also of being a musician in this age is that you don't have to choose like there's like you know yeah, you know, if you were in the 40s and you were a composer, you know, there were very, there was like two stylistic camps to be in. And if you were outside of that, you were basically shunned. Mm -hmm. that, that's gone. 
That's you cool. know, now, like, and I think it's beautiful. Like, and you find this, it's not just in classical music. I mean, it's also in pop, you know, where you have like all of these multiple threads and audiences for all of those threads and it can all coexist peacefully. It doesn't have to be an either or proposition. So, you know, even in the music I did, you know, that that eighth Blackbird commissioned and brought about and in the stuff that I've commissioned and brought about, um, I there's... Yeah, I mean, there's certain composers I like, and you could say that maybe I gravitate toward a certain style, but increasingly I like, I, I the tent is wide. You know, we can have all of these things and bring more things into them and <laughs> and present that to people. And it's it's much more, I feel, as a performer, much more about how you put it forth to the audience and how you connect with them on it. So. Are you still, since leaving 8th Blackbird, are you still focusing primarily on contemporary music or are you moving into other directions? Um, It's still a great love. I mean, I think it does, being outside of 8th Blackbird does provide more opportunities to do other, you know, other musics. I will say though, my expertise and, and still my love and um, I think I have an opportunity to, to be an advocate for new music and mm -hmm. I embrace that role. So I think, you know, I wouldn't expect to see a Bach recording out of me anytime soon, <laughs> uh, but you know, and that's okay. Like I love that repertoire, but it's just not, uh, you know, not probably the direction I'm heading in, so. So maybe you'll commission six solo pieces from another, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I always think with regret about um, Britain, uh, and Rostropovich being together, and I think at a restaurant after a pretty drunken meal, which I think they just they they both used to drink so much. It's amazing. Uh, anyway, so I would say that um, <laughs> um, Rostropovich managed to get Britain to write an agreement on a napkin um, that he would write a companion suite for each of the six bar suites, and sadly he didn't survive to go beyond three. Yeah. But it would have been amazing to get another. Another three of these. I, I, I want to ask Yasko now because I, I'm, I'm going to take you. Uh, Oberlin is is quite uh, big in our family at the moment. Our eldest daughter, Emily, is there. Um, she's not at the conservatoire. She's at the college. Uh, but she's already made some made some friends who are, who, who are playing as well. Um, were, Yasko, when you were there, uh, were, were you also focusing on contemporary music or just a sort of a general sort of broad broader range of, of, of piano stuff? And how did that lead on? Into, in, into your career in opera. Right, so I was there as a piano performance major um, and I studied, you know, my Beethoven piano sonatas and Chopin ballads and all that classic canon. Um, I really didn't do that much contemporary music at Oberlin, unlike Nick Fotinos over here. <laughs> uh, but we did meet. Uh, and I did play on his recital, but I played Brahms F major. <laughs> uh, nothing contemporary. Um, but, you know, by the time I was finishing up at Oberlin, I was starting to realize that I really enjoyed collaborating with others and I really enjoyed making music with other people. And I no longer wanted to lock myself in the practice room for hours and hours on the end just to play one recital on stage of solo music and get really nervous for and all that jazz, right? And so I just, um, and Oberlin was where I discovered my love for collaborating with others. And there were wonderful teachers um, like Phil Highfield and James Hausman who really cultivated that love in me. They showed me the ways um, and they coached me. And I just loved, you know, I mean, and, and Oberlin also had so many wonderful singers and string players and brass players. And I got to make music with all of them. And it was just so ex exciting and thrilling. And so I decided if I'm gonna stick to music and get my graduate degrees, then I might want to focus on collaborative pi uh, piano. And so mm -hmm. I got my master's and doctorate degrees in collaborative piano from Juilliard afterwards. Um, and by the time I was in New York, I was starting to think, you know, I really love vocal music. It's a lot more intimate um, and and you know, it's a different skill set. And I, I I did have hesitations about that, um, but. I thought, well, I guess I should give this a try. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> but eventually I made my way into the opera world. And now that is what I specialize in. And are you associated particularly with uh, the lyric opera of Chicago? 
I have worked there um, during this pandemic year, though. I've been very busy working for Chicago Opera Theater. Oh. It's a small opera company. And so because they're nimble and they can, you know, they can be creative in the way they put out opera productions. So there's been many live stream opera productions that we've done in person. Um, and um, and in the summers, I go to Des Moines Metro Opera. So Iowa has become my second home, like my summer home, Iowa. <laughs> and uh, but uh, my DMMO family is very dear to me. And um, I've just been very you know, fortunate to, um, I guess, find my niche. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, tell us about plans that you, you have for the future. I, I believe, Nick, you've got a, a new team. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, I've had it. I've been there now for a while. So um, in uh, November, I was appointed uh, to the Laundry School of Music in Boston. Congratulations. Um, as, thank you as, um, as faculty cello teacher. And um, apart from that, uh, so... I've been teaching there. I've been teaching um, entrepreneurship as well and some other classes. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, also uh, been doing my own entrepreneurial um, activities, especially um, a program called One to One, which I just finished up uh, this past Sunday in its fifth iteration. And it's basically a week long interactive program for composers and performers, just single pairing together to write a piece and like, have guest faculty come and coach and, and have discussions and which has been really amazing and kind of stemmed out of my experience last summer with um, all of the festivals. I was supposed to, it was going to be one of my busiest summers ever. And then all the festivals just went away, Yeah, which, uh, you know, unfortunately also Great Lakes among them and for yeah. understandable reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just trying to think about ways, you know, I mean, besides the lack of activity, it was also the lack of, um, of community, of that community building that I have, especially every summer I've been teaching for now for uh, 14 years um, at the Bang on a Can Summer Festival in upstate Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And that's a three week festival that, you know, a lot of new music is played and a lot of people come together. And I really missed that sense of performing with people, sharing ideas, um, creating new music. And I wanted to create a platform to do that. So, so that was kind of my answer to that. And that's been really great to do some of that and some other entrepreneurial activities as well great good for you well it's it's wonderful to to keep i mean i i, I think although my own personal playing life has been perhaps a bit more conservative recently um but uh i just think about the beginning of my career playing the bbc symphony orchestra playing a tremendous amount of contemporary music and also in the nash ensemble and yeah. now talking increasingly to my brother during pandemic times who just had his second symphony premiered uh, yesterday in Manchester by the by the Halle Orchestra behind behind closed doors. Um, he married a composer himself, uh, probably as you know, Helen Grime. And I think it's so important to be cultivating composers all the time. And I, I take my hat off to you for for continuing to do it after leaving Eighth Bradford. It's, it's great. It's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. It's really good. I think it's We're, getting I'm, to winding up time. I'm, I want. Is, yeah, is that yeah, correct? Being, We're going to have to be the being told the we need to. <laughs> Just in case, up. just in case you can't see that, I don't know if you can see the comments too. Um, Terry and Bob Ryan are sending greetings, Aww. especially to San Francisco from San Francisco. Aww, <laughs> I hi, see that. Aww. I miss you guys. Thank you so There's much. A number of people who loved it, including uh, Janice Steinhardt, Sandra Pice, uh, Nancy Jones. Our own Raina Kogan. Uh, it, 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 it's been absolutely great. I know that I've left out one question, um, which I'm going to deflect as well, because it's a, uh, <laughs> from, from our, our other board chair, Michael Gehabe, um, who was asking about uh, pandemic. Uh, well, actually, it, it, I think we've got time just to quickly cover this. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it, the the piece the piece that was written uh, for you by uh, by Maria Grenfell that was not written during the pandemic though was it or no it's actually a, it's a bit older piece so it's from two thousand but the version for cello and piano is from twenty twenty as well right last year. right, right. So, no, it's, it's only been performed one other time I think I in see so, so so in terms of Mike, Michael's question was about uh, it was quite a historical question a very interesting about were there specific chamber music pieces inspired by the nineteen eighteen pandemic. You know, I, not 
to my knowledge. Um, but, you know, I wonder if there's going to be, because I read an article early on in the pandemic that talked about, you know, the artistic influence of the pandemic and what happened in the aftermath. And the point of the article, at least, said basically everyone was so in a rush to get back to normal and just do their thing that it was really just completely forgotten. Like there weren't memorial pieces, there weren't, you know. So, but I wonder, you know, um, I wonder if some pieces can be viewed in that light. I, I want, I don't know. I, Not to my knowledge. I often think about the WC Cello Sonata, which was written just slightly before the pandemic, but but that that was certainly, you know, he he he, he it was around, you know, and and he he he. I mean, he already had cancer when he wrote that, anyway. But uh, there's a certain sort of angst in 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 certain pieces from that time that must have been something in the air. Yeah, well, I mean, that was also, you know, on the footsteps of World War II. Exactly. So, you know, there was a lot in the air, even besides the... Exactly. You know. no, it's just, anyway, I just wanted to say to Michael, and I, I could say this to him privately as, as well, but I did look it up briefly. Um, <laughs> and um, there is an interesting article via the BBC Music Magazine about 1980. All, all I could find from it on a brief glance was that Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, Bartok and Shimonovsky got a nasty... They all got nasty cases of the Spanish flu. Hmm. Uh, and thankfully uh, survived, but um, yeah. yeah. So there we are. So it, it's a it's a lesson for us to stay to stay, stay safe. Uh, to stay, yeah. um, I'm, we're going to say a, a warm goodbye to you in in a second. I'm going to just a few uh, things that I always say at the end of these vignettes. Um, uh, I want to thank all of the festival's benefactors, the sponsors, our donors for making this possible. It was another. It was a wonderful way to finish our series of virtual vignettes. Thank you again, Nick and Yasko. It was really, really inspiring. Um, uh, we welcome you to join us in continuing to support our artists. Well, so not you personally, Nick and Yasko, <laughs> just you out there, um, uh, while safely bringing great music directly into your home by donating on our website, which is greatlakeschambermusic.org. And actually plans are coming together for the 2021 Great Lakes Festival. We, we, they're, they're fluid, but we'll see what's going to happen. Um, we hope with some live in-person concerts, uh, which will take place from the 12th to the 19th of June, followed by online virtual performances in July. Opening night will be Saturday, June the 12th at the Kirk in the Hills. Um, for, I'm crossing my fingers as we say this, followed by a series of outdoor concerts um, in a tent, I, I think, um, at Temple Bethel. I'm excited to announce... Um, tonight that in addition to myself, this year's artists will include Philip Setzer, Tessa Lark, Cindy Wu, uh, Kate Lee, Alessio Bax and Nicholas Pan, uh, the wonderful tenor. We will also have two Shouse ensembles, the Yavalas Quartet and the Viano Quartet. Wonderful, wonderful young string quartets. Uh, full programme details, including concert times, dates, repertoire and ticket sales will be announced in April. Um, but uh, before that, we look forward to seeing you all again virtually on the 7th of May, Friday the 7th of May, for the virtual gala celebration with Christine Gerke, myself, um, if I do enough piano practice, and the Talia Quartet. Uh, thank you so much, Nick Yasuko. Very, very wonderful performance, and good luck for the rest of the year. Thank you to you, too. It was our absolute pleasure to perform. Thank you fun. both. Thank you thank very, you so very, much. very much. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers to all of you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.